Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. So today's video, let's step inside. I'll show you why I'm wearing this mask and what we got going on. All right, so the time has come as it's 33 degrees in here. Uh, tonight, we're working on more drywall. And uh, we already started doing some of the bedroom and it's almost done. I think I got one more wall to do. But the reason why I'm wearing this mask is because we're gonna finally start burning through some of this rock wool insulation or mineral wool insulation. And unfortunately, these are the bags that we had left over uh, from doing the garage that Menards wouldn't take back without charging a restocking fee. And the reason why they wanted a restocking fee is because I bought a pallet's worth or several pallet's worth, and they force you to buy more quantity than you want because that's what comes on a pallet. And they won't let you return it uh, without charging you a huge restocking fee. So it's kind of like, screw it, keep it. Now, this stuff over here is meant for a two by 10. So nine and a half inches of cavity, and that will give you an R30 value. Well, our bedroom wall over here that we're insulating for soundproof, not for insulation, is only a two by six wall. So we're basically kind of ripping them apart, which is super easy. Uh, it's not exactly 100% that uh, you'll get a full like five and a half inches. It'll be a little wavy, but not that much of a deal, especially if we're gonna double drywall this side and put up acoustic sealant and all that. So it, it rips down very easily. So far, we've only got one bag used up. So we're only gonna use one more bag over here probably. And then, uh, I don't know, maybe only three total. So we're definitely gonna have some left over by the time we insulate the whole back wall over here. And then maybe we'll insulate this wall in here. So if somebody's taking a shower, uh, you don't stir disturb somebody sleeping because you're cutting down on that sound transmission again through the bathroom wall. So they recommend to not cut uh, mineral wool insulation. To me, it looks like it has almost the same properties as asbestos. I mean, you're basically dealing with microfibers of like rock and it's natural. That gets down into your lungs, that can be very bad. So they don't want you to cut it, they don't want you to rip it if you don't have to. But I'm trying to wear glasses that I've got over here, uh, wearing my mask, being as safe as possible. And then tonight even, I'm gonna get this drywall up over here on this wall, so that way it's locked out and closed out and we don't have to breathe it in anymore. And then we'll just be real careful when we're sweeping up the dust and everything. But that's the game plan for tonight. We're gonna just, again, try and knock out this wall over here, get it drywalled, get it protected. And then now that that doorway is done, actually, maybe I might go ahead and try and hang the master bedroom door, but we'll see what I can get done. But I'm gonna cut up a few more pieces, stick it in here, and then I'm gonna try and decide what I'm gonna do for the open cavity over here. Maybe I don't even have to cut them down. Maybe the fact I can just pinch them in there and uh, they won't fall out because they're pinched in a two by six cavity. And then the drywall will hold it up over here. Uh, but maybe I'll go behind there and stick something back there. But uh, yeah, that's the game plan. So just gonna set up, knock a few more of these out and hopefully we get done with drywalling the master bedroom tonight.
All right, I hope you guys saw what I did there uh, on fast motion. Basically, I got the door framed up, squared up on the outside. So the outside is gonna be flush with that drywall. And right now we have a gap in here where we need to continue our drywall. Now, I just measured this and uh, I don't know if it's a measuring error, my mistake or whatever, but putting a second layer of drywall on here up next to that, only a half of an inch is gonna fit. So we can't do 5 8 5 8 and 5 8 We're gonna have to do 5 8 5 8 and half inch. So that way the door frame and the drywall are completely even. But to square that door up real quick, we got the hinge side on first. I put a screw down there first to kind of hold it so it wasn't falling on me. We opened up the door and got it set on some drywall and stuff to give it its appropriate thickness off of the floor. So that way it opens up appropriately and it's not falling back into the room. And then we go ahead and square up and plumb up our hinge side. And then we go ahead and we frame up the uh, side over here. And just like the other door for the pantry, our gap is pretty much even from top to bottom. It's, it it's, uh, squeezes up a little bit up top, so I can probably push these three uh, screws down in here and shims a little bit tighter to bring the frame closer to the door this way. But the other side doesn't look too bad. There's a little bit of a gap, uh, or I'm sorry, there's less of a gap at the bottom. But if I take the gap out over there, it opens the gap up on that side. So as long as the door isn't hitting down there, I'm fine with that. But our gap on this side looks appropriate and looks good. And uh, we should be good over here. If I had an extra door handle, I'd slap that in there real quick and we'd actually be able to tell how good we are uh, tightness wise. But uh, at least now, if we were to kick on this kerosene heater in the bedroom, it would probably get pretty toasty warm in here. Granted, we still don't have insulation in the attic, but with the door on, we got some insulation panels right there and the windows in, this room would actually get pretty damn toasty. So I'm gonna, finished playing with this one a little bit and uh, next we'll have to move into the bathroom but before we can do that we need to get our plumbing done we need to go get some 16 inch on center insulation for in here so again we keep the noise down when you're taking a shower you're not waking somebody up in the bedroom so can't finish this off in here yet but uh, we got some more to do we're just gonna keep trucking along and uh, yeah hopefully spring is not uh, far away we can get some insulation up in the attic and get our plumbing done. I've got to get that permit done. I have to uh, sketch out where all of my fixtures are going to go. It can basically be on a napkin for my county. And then I have to pay $60 for the application and then $15 per fitting. So that's kitchen sink, that's toilet, that's bathroom, that's washer, utility tub. Every single one of those is $15 each. So. We gotta add them all up there, pay our money, turn in our little napkin, and then we can go ahead and get in, uh, finished on plumbing. And once the plumbing uh, vent stacks and everything are in for the bathrooms and however we're gonna do the laundry room, and if we're allowed to get away with an air admittance valve for inside of the kitchen island, then we get all of our uh, uh, roof penetrations done. We can seal those up get the PVC piping far enough up in there, and then we can go ahead and start insulating the attic. So we just need to get that plumbing permit and get our vet stacks done. But uh, I'm gonna finish playing out here tonight, and then I'll see you guys back tomorrow or another day this week. Oh, and before I forget, let me know what you guys think of this. I've seen some people with big doors, and even just because they want their doors more secure, what do you guys think about on the inside of the gaps where the shims are to put a uh, window and door spray foam? So that way you're not just relying on all of your screws up and around, you're relying on basically gluing the door to the frame. I've never really seen that done except on one video I saw the other day and there were some good notes and bad notes, but let me know what you guys think. Should you secure a door better even though it's on the inside? to put spray foam up and around the frame so that way you glue it and you hold a much better, tighter door. Again, especially because we have such big doors. Eight foot tall by 36 in here. And this door frame is almost seven and a half inches wide to accommodate for all the drywall. This frame and everything is a big, big door. So let me know what you guys think about spray foaming and basically gluing that down and making it a lot tighter of a fit over time.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. So I took that drone drone footage today at about 6 a.m. And uh, well, this, this sucks. I hate flipping from uh, nights to mornings. I had class all day to get recertified on one of my uh, certifications for nursing. So I've been up since 6 a.m. when I was supposed to be going to bed at 6 a.m. So just got home and a few things that I have to do today. I've been noticing that the gate lights are on constantly. So I think the photo cell failed in the on position. So got a new photo cell. We're gonna go out to the electrical panel out here, swap it out. And hopefully as soon as it gets connected, the gate lights actually turn off and then that will obviously save us on electricity and save us on uh, burning those bulbs out and then it looks like we got a Home Depot order over here so I bought the rest of our door handles and uh, so we can get the bedroom uh, installed and just something to think about when you're building a house I was almost gonna buy all the door handles the exact same that uh, I bought for the pantry but of course for a bathroom a bedroom and a bathroom you need a door handle with a lock on it as opposed to one that just straight up opens so all those little things that you got to think about when you're actually building that you can't forget that uh, obviously will help save on time and money that you don't have to be returning something for shipping and uh, you don't have to do it all over again because you forgot all right so like I said the lights are on they should definitely be off uh, I've noticed it for about at least two weeks now and then I had to order one and get it in so like I said I think the photo cell out here just failed and it failed in the on position so I think it's the exact same kind so I think all we have to do is shut the breaker off and then there's three wires up in here hopefully they're just pigtailed or uh, 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 wire nutted on we can disconnect it and then hopefully this should be pretty easy which it looks like there is a failure that is pretty disgusting in there if you can see all that gummed up mold and everything else so maybe actually it hasn't just failed but the photo cell is so dirty that right now it thinks it's nighttime because there's mold blocking the sensor so maybe instead of changing this out real quick i can pop this off and clean it up and then uh, see if they actually they'll turn off well that may be one problem uh i don't know what the heck that is i'm gonna go inside and get some gloves before i jump into a nest or something that's growing in there i don't know how that's getting up in there this is completely sealed kind of if it's a mouse i know they can get through the tiniest holes ever but how the heck did something get up in there in a closed system like that and build a nest so easily actually i think i found it probably that hole right in there which you can see my finger easily climbs up the wood or the plastic here and grows a nest so Let's get that out of there and then let's see if we can easily just swap out this photo cell. Well, there's nothing in it, but I can actually smell something. Uh, I think it's ammonia or urine, but this is actually a much bigger problem than I thought. Uh, see that black line right there? It's chewed through. This line right there, that neutral line, has no longer any white wire on it. The wires right here coming from uh, right here going over to the uh, electrical uh, for the gate and everything. The neutral, all of the white is gone off of that too. So yeah, I don't know what I can do here except for maybe cut the white and everything back over here and cut the black and delete all this. And since there is enough uh, wire right here coming out, maybe we'll still be able to uh, put a wire nut on there and basically pigtail over. And since uh, we're using a, uh, a wire nut inside of a metal box, that should keep it approved that um, it's not exposed, uh, that we're basically extending a wire and making it longer because we're all, we are in a housing. But uh, yeah, this is not good, especially I need to investigate more, especially if they got any wire off of the main wire here or here or off of the neutral or off of the ground uh, that is a bad situation freaking animals so i think i'm gonna have to run to the store real quick cover up this hole best thing that i can think about is they do make a spray foam that's a rodent spray foam so if i get it all up in here uh, if they try to climb back up here and get back to their house 
if they chew through it, maybe it's got some sort of property in it that they don't like the taste or something uh, in the road and spray foam. Other than that, I don't know what to do, but we have to clean this out and get rid of all of this so the acidic urine isn't eating through this. And again, I don't know if that was just them chewing on it or something else, but this is not good and I am freaking pissed off right now. All right, fingers crossed, I think I fixed it. I don't see any damage on the two blacks. I don't see any damage on the yellow neutral or the main ground. It was really just on these 14 gauge wires here. So I cut them all back, cut the bad spots out where the uh, black coating and the white coating actually wasn't removed but the clear coating that's around the black, some of that was a little bit frayed. I did go ahead and put some electrical tape all around that. And then I just electric, uh, electrical tape those wires back together. So I blew it out with the blower, uh, just turned it on and the lights did turn on for like one second. And then once the photo cell registered, they went ahead and turned back off. So I think for right now, everything is good. All of the wires have now been replaced with new going up to everywhere. So again, I don't see any frays down to any bare copper. And uh, again, where there was just a little bit of the clear uh, coating off before you actually got into the color, I just electrical taped it up. So I think we're safe for now. The only thing, like I said, we have to do is I just told Erin before she comes home from work, go get a can of spray foam that's a rodent deterrent. So we'll go ahead and hit down in there. And then I don't know, what if there's a mouse actually that heard me coming and he ran down in this three inch pipe right now, he could actually be down inside of the hole right here. So maybe I'll give a little bit of a spray down inside of there and over here. And then just keep rechecking this over like the next one to two days and to make sure he's not chewing back out or the fact that there was nothing in the nest maybe they've already gone and left but uh for a guy who can't smell there's definitely some ammonia or something going on in here because it stinks well we got good news and bad news aaron showed up with the pest blocker not exactly sure that's gonna work because it's like more for insects and of course, when I opened up the panel, I just saw this freaking head pop out. So that means right now there's one, two, 20, a thousand, who knows, down in the three inch pipe. And if I seal it up with pest blocker right now, uh, if they can't get out and want to chew through that, I can only imagine they're going to want to start chewing down and trying to get out somewhere else. And I don't know if they can chew through the inside of the three inch pole in there or not. Uh, or God forbid they actually chew in through one of the wires thinking that's a way out. It'll obviously kill them instantly when they receive that much amperage. But uh, yeah, I don't exactly know what to do. Um, nothing I can really put down in there to kill it. Except for if I had some sort of non-flammable gas that would suffocate them to death. Uh, but then also wouldn't catch fire if any of this like sparked or anything. But uh, damn mice, I don't know what to do, son of a... Oh, and check this awesomeness out that I just saw. Their pipe cracked and broke here. So that can't be good because any water that comes all the way down the pole here is going to get down into the electrical box and just completely flood this thing with water. So not only did that probably fill up because the bottom of it is exposed an open hole where the wires come out, not only was it probably rat feces or uh, mouse feces and urine getting down in there that messed up the center, but probably any of the water that came down in here also went down inside of the panel and probably went down and got stuck in there. So it was probably a combination of all that that killed that sensor. So yeah, that's not good at all. All right, before I pass out for today, Let's go ahead and get our door knob on. And like I said, it's the exact same thing we had last time uh, on the pantry, except this one is a privacy lock. So it's pretty non-discreet. It looks just like the other one on the pantry, but just this little itty bitty tiny button right there. You just push that in ever so slightly. I mean, just a little 16th of an inch inside click and then the outside locks. And then of course on this side, it looks like there's a pinhole where you have to put something about two inches through to push that open and then it'll unlock the pin coming in from this side and then you'll be able to get back into the room. But uh, let's see how well this works. Let's make sure we can get the door tight and everything like in here is shimmed up properly. And then we'll have a bedroom door finally.
Something I just realized, I absolutely love the fact that these handles aren't circle. It's so much easier to get the screws into the door when you're actually screwing it down. Because when you have a big old knob, they always put the screw like down over here. It is such a pain in the butt to try and screw in a doorknob at this angle when you're trying to put the screw in when the knob's in the way. It's so much easier to have it nice and flat. You can go right in and hit it and it's perfect. All right, close is good, but as you can see, a lot of play in here and that's gonna be annoying. So let's see if we can just adjust the striker plate out a little bit so it catches the pin a little bit harder. And sometimes even when you adjust that striker plate all the way out, you still get a lot of play. So sometimes you may actually have to uh, cut back a little bit on the wood so you can push the striker plate further into the door frame. And then again, that gets it just a heck of a lot tighter, which I actually did have to do on the uh, pantry. So I don't think we'll be able to get the striker plate fully tight uh, by just bending the tab out more. I think we will have to cut this back, but we'll see. Yeah, let's go ahead and take like an eighth of an inch out of the uh, frame, push the striker plate in a little bit more, and then I think we'll be good to go. You just have to be real easy when you're doing this. Make sure that your line is real nice and straight, and then you get this curve in here accurate uh, that you follow up through here. So that way when your striker plate's put back, this isn't looking all disgusting and stuff. You just have to be real careful with how you're chiseling it out. But when you're only moving like a little bit of an eighth of an inch, it's pretty easy to do, especially when you're following the grain of the wood. All right, so not too shabby. A little bit of a scratch right there, but we'll clean it up. We got some wood, uh, epoxy that we can put in or whatever. But again, we're leaving the striker plate pushed out and in so it makes a tighter feel. And again, we just move this in like an eighth of an inch. So now when we give it a close, oh yeah, you can hear how tight of a drum that was when it closed. And now when we go to push on the door, pulling out or pushing in, there is zero play. So this thing is perfect and tight as a drum. And just to test the lock real quick, you just push this little button. Like I said, well, actually we can't test it in here because when you go to push this down, it pushes the pin back open. So uh, we got to test it from the outside. I just got to make sure I have a toothpick or something to put in there or we're not getting back into the bedroom. There we go. The kit comes with an Allen wrench. Not exactly sure what that's for. Uh, there's nothing that I've ever had to adjust on these. But we're closed. We're locked, can't get in. Push the pin back open and now we're in, perfect. All right, another project done. That's looking good and I like the way that it feels. Now, one other thing that we have to do in the master bedroom before this is actually complete is I actually have to go up inside of the attic, which we've got to go up back in there. We still have the back of the fireplace. That is still completely open to the roof. So if you can see up in here, I know it's dark, but all the way back up in there, you have complete access up into the attic. So we have to probably get my dad over here to help me. I need to probably build an internal ladder in there or something to be able to stand on something. And I'll have to cut out each piece of drywall individually to go on each one of the studs. And there's probably at least four cavities up in there in between uh, the studs. He'll hand me the drywall up in through there and I have to screw it from inside of the fireplace cavity into the back of the studs this way, just like we were putting the drywall up everywhere else on this gable end. And then that way you'll be closed off inside of the attic and we can spray foam it and everything. And then we can worry about spraying uh, closed cell spray foam on the back side of those internal gable walls. So that way we're completely sealed and uh, obviously we're not getting cold air coming down from the attic. So probably just do that on another day. But once that's all cleared and uh, blocked off up in there again behind the fireplace, and I get one more piece of drywall up in there sealed off, then we'll be completely insulated from like the attic air, not really wanting to get down here into the house. But we can do that later. Again, I'm gonna go pass out and try and get back on the night shift, and then I'll see you guys back later this week. All right, everybody, welcome back. So I've had some sleep, and uh, I decided after editing this video, we're getting close to the end anyway. 
So I'm gonna spend tonight and finish out these three more panels in here that I got sitting up here of drywall. We're gonna go ahead and block all this off. And then that way we can't get attic air now dropping down inside of the house. And then this week we're gonna have temperatures where it's almost 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna call the spray foam guy out here and uh, I wanna take this time and say thank you to everyone who gave me suggestions on how we should insulate and everything and the game plan that we're going with is this wall right here. It's just gonna be a lot easier to just have the spray foam guys come out here and actually just spray very little. Uh, I'm gonna put some depth markers on these uh, two bys right here that are going vertically and I'm gonna get some depth markers out about four inches and then they can come up here and just spray this triangle uh, gable end wall up in here four inches out. Now that's not attic uh, R value, but it's no different than this wall right here kind of being the outside of your house. Uh, four inches of closed cell spray foam is like an R28. That's a higher value than what the ICF walls are even. Those are only like an R24. So this wall up in here should be very well air sealed and it should have great R value. So then that only leaves us before the spray foam guys come out here is uh, uh, not really dependent upon them, but before we insulate, um, we need to get some depth markers also at about 17, 18 inches high and put them vertically kind of sitting down on these two by four bottom cords. So that way when I'm blowing in the cellulose up here, I've got a height marker of almost 18 inches that I know that I have to get up to. And uh, one thing that I may have to take into consideration when we're blowing in 18 inches uh, on the scissor trusses back in here, we may have to actually extend our attic venting because we may get the uh, blown in too high up and it actually may start to go down those vent channels. While the scissor trusses don't have a lot of vent channels, we've only got about five over there and I think none on the front of the house because um, the porch is there. So there is no attic ventilation uh, again because of the porch. So we really might just have to extend those five out there and then just blast in all of the closed cellulose. The only thing that we have to think about is I may have to get some uh, Tyvek or something and we may have to put some Tyvek from here up to about here of about 18 inches or else all of this blown in right here is obviously just gonna fall off and come down in here and then we'll have absolutely no attic insulation right here. So just put up a little Tyvek bag right here and then that should seal off uh, everything up in there and we sh still should have enough room up in there that we can walk on through after we're done blowing in everything in case we need to come back over here one day and do some inspection. So that is the game plan for tonight just knocking out the drywall, putting on some depth markers, maybe put some more depth markers up in here, and then we should be at a wrap uh, for this video. And the next video, hopefully we can have the spray foam guys out here to quote us on these triangles, and then we should be good to go. All right, everybody, all done. Uh, I did put some spray foam up in there just to seal the holes for now. But again, the spray foam guys are gonna come back and I want them to spray pretty much the top plate down there all the way up to the two by four out there and go out four inches. And then I just got done putting on these little boards over here. I had some extra furring strips. So we just strategically kind of placed them uh, everywhere around. They're 18 inches tall. We got them back here in the back, in the middle, and just kind of going all throughout. So that way when I'm up here blowing uh, the blown in cellulose in, I know exactly where I need to be. And it's actually funny. I thought it would actually be uh, taller than that with more insulation. But uh, I guess 17 and a half or so isn't that much. But uh, one thing I did want to mention, um, somebody asked me and I did the calculations on here. If code in this area is only an R49, for this entire attic only being just over like 1900 square feet, it makes absolutely no sense to just do the minimum code. Just spend the extra money. Uh, it's an extra several bags, which are only like $10 or so, to go from an R49 up to an R60. It's literally $400 difference. 
I don't care if you live in Florida and the code gets smaller and smaller, why would you want that Florida heat to come down into your house when you can just blow in kind of like an R60 everywhere and it's only gonna cost you a couple hundred bucks? $400 is absolutely nothing to ensure you're getting that much more insulation over time. And on the uh, cellulose that I'm gonna buy from Home Depot, and again, you get the rental machine for free when you buy over a certain number of bags, um, it does say on the product that it will settle over time. So if you blow in like a 17 and a half, it's gonna compress down to like 16 something. So why not just blow in the 18 inches, let it compress a little bit, which is initially what I knew that was gonna happen and just get that R60. Just make your ceiling as comfortable as, com uh, as can be uh, and as possible and just get it done right and just spend a couple extra dollars. So I'm gonna continue out moving these uh, little furring strip pieces up in here to get an idea what 18 inches is gonna look like over in here, especially down uh, in there where we need to be. Then I'll go over on that side and then I will be done. So uh, I'm gonna wrap this video up here. So if you like the content, if you like what we are going to do, I know I didn't go with everybody's suggestion on how we're going to insulate, but in my opinion, I think we've got this air sealed well enough. I think the ceiling paint that we're going to use, which is a class two vapor retarder, is going to be awesome to spray up onto the ceiling. That's going to give us our vapor retarder and uh, help with air control movement too. Um, closed cell spray foaming this so we get that super high R value. R60 all throughout here, and I think we're gonna be good. So let me know what you guys think. Uh, hit the thumbs up if you agree. Write down in the comments if you disagree or think I should have done something different. Subscribe if you're not already, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Take care.